Gabriel Grant talking about distributed real-time web apps with Stack.io. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I hope you guys have enjoyed PyCon CA so far. Uh, so my name is Gabriel, and as I was introduced, I'm here to talk about building distributed real-time web applications. Um, so. I hope to have this up earlier, um, but I had a little bit of trouble getting my slides up. Um, but if, uh, since this talk is about real time, uh, I figured what better way to show you um, why server-side push is cool than with a presentation itself. So you can actually follow along if you visit that link. Either snap it on your phone or type it into your laptop. Does everybody have that? Is the link broken? OK, uh, I don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to skip that for now. But I would be happy to show that to you guys later. I thought it was super cool when it was working. Anyways, enough of that. On to business. Uh, so for the past year and a half, I've been working at DocCloud, uh, which is basically a platform that takes a lot of the pain out of application deployment and helps um, with development, too. Uh, but basically, what we do is we, whoop, 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 dot cloud. <laughs> um, basically, what we do is uh, we let you describe your ideal stack. You push, you know, you um, choose your production setup. You pick your languages. You pick your database. You push your code to us, and it lets you sort of not worry about the tough stuff of configuring and scaling and managing and all of that. Um, anyways, I'm not really going to talk about dot cloud today very much. Um, if you want to know more, come talk to me after. Also, they are hiring. Um, I actually. I'm not there anymore, but I'm still on very good terms with them. They're all good friends of mine, and I'm representing them here today. Um, so I'd be happy to pass you along to them. Um, anyways, the point is that what we do is essentially wrangle a really big distributed system, with a lot of servers everywhere. Um, and so we needed a way to tie that system together. Okay. Uh, so I was at a conference recently talking with a really smart guy uh, named Henrik Joriteg, uh, and he asked, what is a web application? Which I think is a really pertinent question. Um, he was saying that basically the conclusion was that um, a web application is something, really, it's a way of managing data, right? If we think about what's the main interface of a web application, take something like Gmail, for example. Right? When we think of Gmail, generally, I think of a web browser, right? It's a web application, it's sort of like the first really popular, really rich web application that we all, uh, often at least for me, comes to mind. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, when I'm using Gmail, I'm not actually on my computer, right? I'm on my phone. Um, so really, there's at least, you know, there's two other interfaces in addition to the web. There's also the native Android and native iOS apps, probably other platforms as well. Um, but also, you know, when we talk about that web browser, really that web browser application, you know, there's really multiple of those as well, right? There's a tablet, a phone, and a desktop version. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other inter interfaces too, right? It's a mail client, so you have or a mail service, so you have IMAP and POP. Um, there's also WAP, if you guys remember the old dumb phones um, back in the bad old days. Um, that still exists. There's also, uh, for at least some of the functionality, there's an HTTP and REST interface. Um, so what, what is the app itself? The point really is that the API becomes very important. Um, which is why we always use REST, right? You know, REST APIs are, are pretty. That's, that's what everyone tells us to do. Um, you know, at least for CRUD, right? REST is pretty good for CRUD. So let's, let's take an example. Let's link an existing user to an existing group RESTfully, right? What's the right way to do that? Anyone have an idea? You know, we could do something like this, right? We could say, okay, we're editing the user um, and we're adding it to a group. So we're going to post with some sort of ugly query string. Or we could, we could put, maybe we're updating the user with a like add to group. Um, maybe though, you know, we could say that we're adding, editing the groups, right? Maybe we're, we're adding the users to the group, so we're doing either of those two things with the group. Maybe, maybe we have this whole other entity called memberships. Who knows? Maybe we're creating a new membership. Does anyone have an opinion as to which of these, which of these is the best? That one? Anyone else? Right. 
yeah, I mean, those are all, all good options. Um, I think I'd probably personally go with this one as well if I was restifying this API. But I think the point is really that it doesn't actually matter that much in the grand scheme of things. Because really, your REST API, what I want to argue is that it's not your API so much. That really, your API is about the functionality behind it. And your REST API is just one possible serialization of that functionality. It just so happens, though, that we have this tool that was designed expressly to express functionality. And that's programming languages, right? What we use every day. Python, pretty nice for expressing functionality in an API. So what I'm actually going to argue today is that we should be starting to build and think about our APIs as being more layered. Um, so what I, wanted, what I want us to do is to expose core functionality over multiple transports, but sort of separate the idea of the transport from the API and the functionality itself. So when I talk about a layered API, really what I'm talking about is the first, the most core layer, the largest API, is what we have in process. Right? In Python, we really don't hide anything. We sort of assume that we're all consenting adults, and we let each other poke at whatever we want inside the process. Um, sometimes we discourage it with an underscore, but really it's all available. Um, what we expose over the network, though, um, we don't want that to be quite as rich in API, right? We don't want everything exposed over the network. That would be a bit of a disaster, because um, we don't assume that people are consenting adults on the internal network. Um, that being said, we do want a fair bit of functionality available, right? It makes things, first of all, we, you know, we do assume that people are generally trusted if they're inside our firewall. Um, and also, it's, you know, it's nice to be able to provide rich functionality. Um, then the last layer, the smallest of these three, is uh, what we expose to the external network. Right? So this, again, is a subset of what we expose to the internal network. Um, you know, because a lot of the time, we, whatever, on our internal network, um, we let one server update and delete resources on another that probably we don't want anyone in the world to be able to do. Um, so when we, we sort of started thinking about APIs in this way, and we came up with some specific requirements for building a system um, to build these sort of rich distributed APIs. So the first is that we wanted to have minimal modification of our Python code. We really like Python a lot. <laughs> like I said, it's a beautiful way to expose APIs, and I don't think there's any real way to have to, or real reason to have to um, bastardize this beautiful syntax too much. Um, so if I can do import foo and then call foo.bar, um, we want to do something like this, where we can say foo is actually a remote service, and we can call foo.bar. Um, there are a few other things. Um, Again, a lot of these sort of come from Python. We want a self-documenting system, right? So we want the methods, the signatures, the doc strings, all of that to be available without opening the code of the remote service or relying on constantly out-of-date documentation outside of the code itself. Uh, we wanted to propagate exceptions. We want uh, this to be language agnostic. So we, use, we do use a, a lot of Python at uh, Doc Cloud, but we also do use um, uh, some Node.js as well for some of our routing mesh. Um, and so we, we wanted it to be usable in multiple languages. Um, we wanted it to be brokerless uh, to minimize the hops so that we could have the, the realest of real time um, and also to minimize the uh, points of failure. Um, and then we also wanted to be able to tra trace and profile nested calls. Um, so basically we want to be able to say, you know, which subcall of this complex call chain um, raised some exception or, you know, which subcall of the complex call chain causes the whole um, the whole call to take forever. Both important questions and sometimes difficult to dig out of big distributed systems. Um, so those were all kind of um, requirements that, were, that came from our back-end needs, right? Um, that's sort of the second layer of the API I was talking about, what we expose on our internal network. Uh, but there are also a couple that are extremely important when you come to an external network, uh, the first of which is obviously off. You can't just have anyone poking at anything. Um, and the second, although it's nice on the internal network, it's really critical in the external network to have service discovery um, because you don't want to just have to be exposing every single internal system uh, to the outside world. So why not HTTP? Um, it's great, right? It's, it's well tried, true, tested. Um, but uh, there are some problems with it, right? So there, first of all, there's, there's too much overhead for some cases. Um, for specifically, our logs and metric data are just huge volumes of data. Um, uh, continuous streaming of updates is really probably the primary reason that this is really difficult. There's no, um, it, it requires extra work, right? Either you end up with chunked encoding or you use WebSockets or 
some other hack, um, but it's not really well baked in, uh, especially if you want it to work both front end and server to server. Um, in the same way, asynchronous notifications require some of the same extra work. Maybe you can use long polling from the front end or you can use web sockets, but again, it's not entirely clear what, what the true way to do that is. Um, also, we have some cases where we have a fan out topology, um, and those are pretty difficult to build with um, HTTP. Again, it requires extra work. You have to implement some sort of message queue. Um, so another example of a message queue is something like AMQP or something similar, so it's be like RabbitMQ. Um, but again, this has, does have a fair bit of overhead in some cases. That's, that was too much for us. Um, and also, it requires a broker right from the get-go. Um, so we came up with Stack.io. Um, so Stack.io is an open source tool uh, to easily build real-time web applications by making it simple to expose beautiful APIs. Um, there's sort of three primary creators of Stack.io. Um, so Stack.io kind of came from a combination of, of places. So Yusuf Simonson um, had just finished writing his master's thesis on generative communication, which is this sort of esoteric use of what are called tuple spaces, where you sort of throw things out into this magical tuple space and then Sometime and someplace later, someone picks it up. Um, it's a little bit crazy. Um, it's very academic. Uh, it's very cool in some ways. Uh, and so he was super interested in, in implementing something like that. Um, and then he met Afix, who had been working at Dot Cloud and is a really, really intelligent systems guy. Um, and so basically, together, they sort of um, married the sort of academic side uh, with uh, the practical requirements that we had at the company um, and came up with a pretty cool system. Um, and then Joffrey did a fair bit of the implementation and is the current maintainer of the project. Um, so the end result is basically, it's a framework, like I said, for building real-time applications as a collection of services. Um, and it's, it's built on uh, Zero RPC, which is a project we released earlier, Zero MQ, um, and Message Pack for serialization. Um, so basically it uses a configuration-free bi-directional service-to-service and service-to-front-end messaging, um, which makes it easy to decompose sort of more complex logic into a lot more functionally simple um, and smaller units, um, which, like I said, can potentially be in different languages. Uh, just talked about that. <laughs> um, so basically there are three main components to the system. Um, the first as I just mentioned, are the services. So these are small, decoupled, single-purpose components. Um, the next is that there's a hub. Um, so this is not a broker. The messages all go point to point. Um, but the hub does a few things. It does uh, discovery and coordination of the different nodes in the network. Um, and also acts as a bridge to the external clients so that the external clients don't need to have access to all of the services on the internal network. Um, and finally, perhaps most importantly, there are the clients that actually make use of the system that we're building. Um, so these clients can either, like I said, be internal to the network or external, um, and basically they consume the services. Uh, it's also optionally distributed. Um, so all of these different services, they can actually be running on a single machine. In our case, we want some of them running on a single machine and some of them running in a variety of places. Uh, so let's look at a really quick example. Um, so this looks a little bit like our my earlier our requirements. Uh, basically, we are instantiating a stack, um, creating this class that is a service, uh, and then exposing it over the network. Um, so it is fairly simple. Um, and then we can call that um, almost equally simply, again, by um, using the hello service that we've declared previously. Um, and then we can say hello PyCon CA. Um, also, we can call this from JavaScript. Uh, so it's a little bit uglier because, uh, as I mentioned, we're using gevent on the Python side, which makes all of our asynchronous stuff. Yeah, is that David? I can't see. Of course, it's David. I love gevent. I love gevent too. Um, JavaScript, no gevent. <laughs> JavaScript, lots of callbacks. Um, but callbacks are all right in JavaScript because that's kind of the way things work. And so we essentially do the same thing. We use a hello service. We say hello. And then we console.log it out. So that's that, you know that's cool, um, but isn't that kind of just like just a pretty simple RPC system? Um, and the answer is what I've shown you so far. Yes, it is. Uh, but there's a bit more to it. Um, so the cool part of zero RPC, 
by Zero RPC, I of course mean Stack.io. Zero RPC is the underlying layer. Um, is that it has streaming. Um, so basically, the way this works is that the server returns an iterator, and the client code gets an iterator. Which, for those of you that love iterators, David, I hope that's also you, is really cool. So we can do something like this, where we say stream, um, and then we, instead of returning a response, we yield a response. Um, and then on the client side, we will get that back incrementally. Um, the rest of this is all sort of the same. Basically, what that means is that for small latency, um, well, so, okay, so this is, it's really useful um, for, you know, doing things like this. Um, but it also, you know, it, sometimes you have like tons of little messages, right? I mentioned our logging messages before. Um, with that, we deal with it by having, um, basically, we can, uh, we can sort of pre-push elements um, and to, to, so that the client can notify the server when the pipeline line runs low so that we can always have a full pipeline there. Um, and with, with larger, you know, say we want to stream some big file across the network, um, we can do the same thing. We can sort of chunk that file up so we never have to actually load the whole thing into memory. Also, and perhaps more excitingly, is that you can use this same mechanism to do possibly filtered pub sub and state synchronization. So basically what we do here is instead of sending, you know, asking, having a client ask for a stream of messages and get one message back, we'd have the client ask for a stream of messages and then some other client push messages into a queue that then get broadcast out to all of the clients that are waiting for their iterator. Um, we can also do state synchronization in a very similar way. Um, so we have these, um, there's basically some of these patterns are built in to make it super simple. So here I have an example of where we're, we have uh, one client would roll a dice, um, or a die, and then that die, the result of that die roll would be synchronized out to a bunch of other clients that have connected. Um, so here, um, anyways, I don't have much time, so I'm not going to go over that. But that is also, coincidentally, how the slide system works. Um, were it working? I'd love to show it to you guys afterwards. Um, basically, we have, there's essentially, it's really simple. Like, this is all of the Python code that's there. There's obviously a bit of JavaScript code um, as well. But basically, all we're doing is that we have this uh, state synchronizer, and we expose it over the network. And so basically, there's just you guys as clients. All you have to do is call this watch current frame. And that just every time the frame changes, every time I, from my computer, am calling this set current frame, um, your devices get a message that the current frame is updated, and the frame changes. Uh, I only have one minute left, so let's just say you can find all of this at stackiota.cloud.com. And thank you. Does anyone have any questions?